How you doing? This is Mike Sabatini from Attacker. Uh, we originally started in 1983 in the city of Bayonne, New Jersey, and we were originally called Warlock, and unfortunately because of the German Warlock, we had to wind up changing our name, and because of the song Call on the Attacker, we took the Attacker name, and that kind of became our mantra. I played drums. I started playing drums, I believe it was 1982. I originally started off as a keyboard player, but because keyboard has so much theory involved, I, it, it was just too much to bear, I guess. Uh, being, I actually started playing drums when I was 19. So being a late blooming musician, I somehow gravitated towards the drums, and I'm glad I did, because keyboards probably wouldn't have worked out. Brian Smith, I played bass for Attacker. Um, first heard about the band, late 80s, I'm gonna say 88 probably around the time when the second coming came out. A good friend of mine brought me downstairs and actually took out the uh, Battle at Helm's Deep album on vinyl. He's like, dude, you gotta check this out. So, you know, going from there, hearing that first and then the second coming, you know, I was a fan 30 something years ago, whatever it is, from the age of 16. Uh, and now I've been in the band the last about four and a half years. So it's pretty wild growing up as a teenager, going to see, you know, these shows and, and, and really digging the music and now being out there, you know, traveling with the guys and, and, and playing the songs that, uh, you know, I grew up on. So it's a little surreal at times for me. Bobby Lucas, lead singer of Attacker. Hi, I'm Mike Benetano, lead guitar player from Attacker. Joined in about 2000. Been in a band for about 18 years now, from Hoboken, New Jersey. Knew the guys all my life growing up with them, so I fit right in, perfect fit with the family. I'm a lead guitar player for Attacker. I started playing about 15 years old. My father bought me my first guitar at 15, acoustic guitar. Taught myself how to play lead guitar on acoustic. You know, Metallica's first album, all the guitar solos and stuff. I learned on acoustic guitar and uh, took it from there. How you doing? I'm John Hasselbrink. I play guitar for Attacker. Uh, I joined in August of 2016, and I've been playing for 35 years. Well, originally when I started playing drums, I started jamming with some local musicians, you know, just kind of getting my chops up as being a drummer. And uh, Attacker, or Warlock at the time, started when I had met one of the original guitar players, Dominic, Sp uh, Dominic Spina, we were both going to a college in Jersey called St. Peter's College. That's where I met him. He was actually playing with the other guitar player who spent many years with me up until the last record, Pat Marinelli. And the three of us actually formed Attacker. And from, from then on in, I brought in our original singer, Bob Mitchell, because we had, uh, he was a little younger than me, but we were in high school together. And the original bass player, John Joseph, we were rehearsing one day, and we didn't have a bass player at the time. He just come run. He came running into where we were rehearsing, like acting like a maniac, and wound up becoming the bass player somehow. Because he was friends with them, and they knew we played bass. So that's pretty much how the whole band, the band thing, started. So about four and a half years ago, when I got in, um, drummer, an old drummer of mine that I used to play with back in the '90s, shared a rehearsal space in the attacker room. And as it turns out, their previous bass player had left. And he sent me a text. He's like, look, you know, Attacker's bass player split. He goes, if you want, he goes, I'll drop your name in the hat and see what happens if they're doing auditions or what have you. I said, absolutely, you know. So he mentioned it to Sabatini, who gave me a call probably a day or so later. And, you know, we just talked for a bit on the phone and what have you. And he was like, you know, do you think you'd be interested in coming down? I was like, hell yeah, you know. So... You know, they gave, I don't know what it was, three, four, five songs. They had a couple of different or guy, uh, guys audition and whatnot. And I guess I did two, maybe three auditions and um, got the gig, and here I sit. So as far as learning the songs when, you know, auditioning, and then once I got in, to continue, like, all right, cool, you got it. Now learn these 12, 15 songs, of which, you know, a lot of the material is, is not easy. You know, a lot of the stuff that Mikey's written and the stuff in the past, it's you know, intricate, riffy, whatnot. Um, but growing up as a kid, the way we used to do it was what, you know, a tape player learning all, you know, Iron Maiden songs or whatever it was that was your thing that got, got you started playing. Um, you know, we'd sit there, listen, rewind. 
get the part, listen, rewind, get the part. You know, it's not like today, I, I think, you know, kids who pick up the guitar or bass or drums, whatever, you could put on, you know, YouTube, and there's like a, a tutorial for every single song almost, you know, but coming from an old school mentality of you just woodshed it and sat there and just listen to the parts over and over again, you know, some of the stuff comes quicker than others, they're like, I got that, and then some of the stuff like, what the hell is he doing, you know, but you got to put the work in, you got to put the time in, and, and that's basically it. Yeah, I've been singing with the Tackers since the end of 2012, and uh, what happened was they were looking for a singer, actually, uh, from what I remember, they were not having luck finding somebody with that range that was able to cover the older material, and I was a fan since I'm a young guy, since maybe 18 years old, or 17, 18, when Battle of the Helms Deep came out. I actually heard them on the Metal Massacre album before that, even. Uh, an older brother of a friend of mine always used to go out get the imports and play stuff for us. So when I heard that, I was like, wow, really? I, I was like, I wish I could try out for them. You know, I could sing that stuff. So he's like, oh, you want me to get in touch with them? I can, I can you know, I can ask if, they, if they'll try you out. So that's what happened. And I did get the audition. And I uh, went down to Jersey City one afternoon and tried out. And I, I was terrible that day. I, I sucked. I mean, I was, I'm telling you. I thought I was, I thought I did, I did horrible. But, um, Luckily, Mike had seen me sing in uh, one of the other bands I was in, Overlord, and uh, he knew what I was capable of. And you know, they they said, "Man, listen, you know, if you got you want the job, you got it." So I got the gig that afternoon, and I've been with him ever since. It's going to be six years now, coming up. Yeah, like I said before, I knew Attacker, the guys from the band for for years, and uh, we used to share the same rehearsal spot I did with um, a previous band of mine, Mass Hysteria, and we used to they used to play right after us, and they would hear us play and they approached me, they liked the way I played, they approached me about joining the Jersey Dogs at the time. Um, and of course I was happy to oblige. And then when the, that folded, attacker reincarnated and I uh, wound up joining them. Easy fit. Bobby and I used to play in another band called Morbid Sin and uh, after Pat Marinelli left, I, uh, he called me up. And the rest is history pretty much. From the first uh, practice, you know, they said, you want to join? I was like, yeah, hell yeah. So, here we are. Yeah, the name Warlock, I, I came up with it. I honestly don't know how I did. It's just something that, stu I, I guess, a word that I saw and stuck in my head. And uh, like I said, when we had to change it because of uh, Doro's Warlock, um, actually, our at the time, he wasn't our bassist, but Lou Charler, who became our bassist, He's the one who suggested Attacker because we had the song Call on the Attacker. And it was actually his at his insistence, you know, use, use Attacker to be a great name. So we took the Attacker name and then probably within a year after that, he wound up leaving the band Hades that he was in and joined Attacker. Yeah, inf influence-wise, I would say, you know, it was, it was really the big metal bands of the time. Like, for me personally, it was Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Scorpions, Except, Riot, you know, th things along those lines. For, for, like, Jim Mooney, he was, he was a little older than us, so he had a lot of the 70s influences, like the UFOs and, you know, Uriah Heep and pretty, pretty much anything 70s and hard rock. That was his realm. I think the rest of the guys, we were all from the, you know, the early 80s, new wave of British heavy metal. That's, that was really what influenced us the most and, you know, I guess what we... You know, that's where our style kind of comes from. And even, even when I listen to things I play, I can hear those influences. And people may not notice it, but I'll, I'll think to myself, oh, I kind of ripped off that fill from that guy, you know, and you put it in the song. But, but you do tend to pull that all together and make it your own, and that's what we did. And a lot of my influences are Merciful Fate, Guitar Team, uh, Iron Maiden, of course, Black Sabbath, my favorite all-time band. That's what started it all for me. So... That's, that's my main influences. Uh, my main influence is probably Randy Rhodes, my favorite guitar player of all time. Regarding songwriting, back then the songs were basically, whoever wrote the song would write the whole song and basically present it to the rest of the band. And we would, we would basically put our little stamp on it and at that point if we had to change the length of uh, like a verse or a chorus, maybe vocally, we would do that. But it's never really been the type of band where we all got in a room and people would just throw ideas around. It's usually songs are prepared by the writer 
brought to the rest of the guys and we learned them and kind of fleshed them out with our own, you know, my style of drumming adding to it or whose guitar parts and vocal melodies and, and things like that. That's how we've always done it. Uh, currently I'm the, the main songwriter musically for Attacker the last two albums primarily, uh, including the new EP and a lot off of uh, The Unknown and some uh, input in uh, Soul Taker. Yeah, the first album, Battle at Helm's Deep, the actual concept of, the, of using Battle at Helm's Deep was, was from our original singer, Bob Mitchell. Uh, he, he brought that to the table. Um, really on the album, there, that was the only song really dealing with that was Battle at Helm's Deep. And I guess, I guess musically, you know, a lot of the, I think the first album was probably more influenced by some of the 70s rock, because Jim Mooney, uh, who he wrote a majority of that record, he was more like a, you know, like a, a UFO guy from the 70s and all kind of 70s hard rock. So that album is more, probably more geared towards that and a little, you know, I would say out of all our albums, it's probably the most unique sounding because it's, it, it, it does have its own thing because of, it, because of what the influences were. And, you know, lyrically, obviously, Bob Mitchell brought in, you know, you have the song, you know, The Hermit, you know, Battle at Helm's Deep. He had the song Kick Your Face, which is just about being like, it's like a rowdy metal party song. Uh, Dance of the Crazies was just a, a ridiculous song about being crazy, you know, it wasn't. And call, obviously, Calling the Attacker, which became like our signature song, that was more or less just the whole, you know, warrior type of guy, you know, doing his thing, protecting people. You know, it's, that's really what it was. I mean, truthfully, those guys are better to talk to about that because, you know, I, I had a hand in a little bit of the writing of some of the stuff musically, but it was really Jim Mooney and Bob Mitchell that did a, a bulk of that album. Basically, when I first started out, the first drum set I had, it was bought for like $250 at like a little used music store, and it was actually a set that the, the actual covering was ripped off and it was just painted red. So that was my first crappy drum set that I, you know, honed myself on. My second kit was a, a Slingerland brand drum set. It was actually a pretty nice set. It was black chrome. So I had the double bass, two toms, two floor toms. And probably about 1988, I went to, I started playing Yamaha drums. And ever since then, I haven't changed. I love Yamaha. As far as I'm concerned, they're, they're recording custom drums. Best drums you can, that, that money can buy and you can play. And they're also, incidentally, the most recorded drum set as far as studio musicians and, and people that have done it. So that's my brand, and I stick with it. I currently use Kemper amplification, state of the art, um, awesome piece of equipment. Uh, before that, I was a you know, sworn and tried and true uh, believer in tube amps, Marshalls, Mesa Boogies, primarily Marshalls I used for many years. So for me to transition to uh, like. Uh, computerized piece of equipment like Kemper it was kind of a stretch and I didn't uh, didn't know if it was gonna work so well but it, like, I swear by it it's a great piece of uh, equipment. Um, I've used Charvel guitars primarily I've been using them for since I started actually and I, I love them but that's that's my go-to guitar. I first started my father bought me a crate stack when I was like 17 years old not too happy to admit that but it was free, you know. <laughs> uh, it, it worked for a couple of years, and then, uh, of course, graduated to the Marshalls. And that's uh, up until the Kempers. That's about, that's where I was using for years. Yeah, the hardest thing with with a band itself, I guess, keeping it together, is you're dealing with if you're a five man band, you have five personalities. Number one, you know, it's hard enough for people to have relationships and make them work. And uh, it's it, our struggle. I mean, really, the, back then in the '80s, there was a lot of places to play. There was actually a lot of competition, so it was kind of hard to to rise above, you know, because you had so many bands, so many shows going on constantly. And you know, and again, as as time went on, we had problems with members. You know, we had we had issues with our first singer, Bob. He had to go. You know, the, I I think the biggest thing is the time spent changing members. You know, w waiting to find the people, you lose time. You know, we should have been out there playing more, doing, you know, putting more albums out. We only had the two albums out in the 80s. And I think that's probably one of the biggest detriments is not having done more and got out to tour more in, you know, back then, which that really affects us now even as, you know, where your status is among the older cult bands. You know, our, our biggest problem, I guess, with live was we, because of the changes within the band, we never really did the amount of touring we wanted to. Like, in the area, 
we, you know, we had played like in New England, you know, the tri-state area, New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, New England. We had done a bunch of shows with Fate's Warning. I mean, mainly Lemoor was a great place because we had done opening shows for Saxon, Sabotage, Overkill, Motorhead. We had done an opening, you know, we played with Metal Church in New Jersey. But I think our, our biggest issue was we, because of the changes in the band, we never got to do the touring that we really wanted to. I, you know, I remember one time we were supposed to do something with Omen, do like a Southwest tour in the United States with Omen. Something happened and that fell through. So it was really just, you know, a lot of, a lot of that was timing. You just had to get on it and do it. And, you know, and again, our, our thing was we didn't get to play as many other areas. You know, we never got to Europe in the 80s. We didn't, get, we didn't actually play in Europe until 2004. But, you know, I guess, you know, we did make enough of an impact with the first two albums that, you know, when we did go overseas especially, we were worried that people wouldn't remember who we were and we'd get on stage and there'd be crickets. But it was the complete opposite. So, you know, when you go to Europe too, you know, people show up with the vinyls. Every, everything you did, whether you were in other bands and stuff, they brought everything from everything we've ever done to get signed. You know, whether it was Bob Mitchell was in Sleepy Hollow, you know, myself and Mike Benatatis, Lou Charler, we had Jersey Dogs after Attacker. These people had everything. So we were lucky and blessed that we made enough of an impact you know, that, you know, it, it afforded us the opportunity now to do what we do right now. All right, as far as anything funny, um, I don't know how many people out there really get to spend a lot of time with uh, our singer, Mr. Bobby Levelums Lucas, but if you do, or if you haven't, uh, you're pretty much, you're going to laugh your ass off a good portion of the day. Um, you got to be around him just to get it, and you know the guy's a ham. He's a funny bastard. Uh, but luckily, you know, I think currently we have a really good chemistry. You know, we've talked about it, and Mike touched on it. It's hard to keep a band together. You know, five, five different personalities, and you know things like that. Um, but we have a good time. You know, we actually do. We all get along. Um, love what we do. You know, love the music, and I think it shows in. The recording and and especially the live shows, you know, I think we're a particularly live band. You know, I think people there's a good connection when we play with the audience, and you know we don't we don't dial it in when we get up there. You know, we go balls out for lack of a better term. Oh uh, yeah, some funny stories. Uh, I remember with Morbid Sin, a uh, big influence for me was always Kiss, and then later on King Diamond. Uh, so I used to come out in the corpse paint and they would actually literally carry me out in a coffin. And I was actually coming out in the coffin probably before King Diamond started doing it, which was pretty ironic. But um, I remember a girl screaming and fainting at Club Binet when I came out of the coffin. That was pretty, that was pretty wild. Um, we, won that, we won Battle of the Bands once, we won $400 and went out and bought $400 worth of beer. And invited everybody at the Battle of the Bands to go party with us in the woods. Um, but I mean, the funniest story was one back then. Um, we're talking eighty, God, eighty-six, maybe eighty-seven. Some girl wanted to hang out with us so bad that she jumped out of the second story, out of her window. It was like through the second floor and broke both her feet. So she got the nickname Cement Feet after that because they <laughs> she was walking around with two casts on her feet. So I mean, I don't know. I mean, there's other, but this it's the debauchery that went on. It's <laughs> yeah, back in 1985, we had done a show at, uh, I'm sure everybody knows the name Lamore in Brooklyn. That was a, pretty much the biggest club in the world at the time. It was, uh, it was Attacker, Fate's Warning, uh, opening up for Motorhead. And while we were playing, the crowd is spitting at us because Motorhead's crowd is like what a Slayer crowd is now. They only want Slayer. Back then, they only wanted Motorhead. So we're spitting back and forth with the crowd. So it was, it was, it was an interesting time. That was definitely a show we'll never forget. And I think, I think our bass player, Lou, he drank a little too much before we played. And I think he tripped and almost fell off the stage when he fell over the monitor. So that was a, an interesting show to do. Some of the more uh, impressive venues we have played in the last couple of years, especially uh, Europe, uh, Keep It True Festival, Metal Soul Festivals. We just came back from France, we played the Peridian Morius Open Air Festival, Headbangers Open Air Festival in, uh, in Germany. Amazing festivals, all of them. We've been going over to overseas for, since 2004, and it's just a totally different world over there, the music scene compared to the States. 
It's uh, to welcome you with open arms. It, it, it's it's like it never ended. The metal, like it, it's like 1980s over there. No, it's never never stopped. It's, it's hard to pack a house in the states. You know when we play it. You know, festivals are one thing, but doing one-off shows, it's hard to pack a house. You know unless you're a bigger name band. So. When the band started out, we, were, we originally rehearsed in uh, the guitar player Dominic Spina, the very first, one of the first two guitar players, in his garage in Bayonne, New Jersey. It was kind of weird. We did one show with him, and after that show, he quit the next day. Nobody knows exactly why, so we wound up having to move to a different location. And ever since then, we had moved to, uh, we were rehearsing in, in our, you know, our hometown, Hoboken, New Jersey. And... Interestingly enough, we used to rehearse five nights a week. We would play from Sunday to Thursday, take off Friday and Saturday because that was party nights. But and the, and the thing was, like, we would play five nights a week, and if one guy had to miss like a Tuesday, we, we would be like, "What do you mean you have to miss rehearsal?" You know, like, it was almost like we were like the military, and you had to be there, you had to rehearse. So really, we, back in the day, we rehearsed a lot, and you know, so we had that place in Hoboken. We had moved to another place in uh, in another local town, Jersey City. But we, we were like a machine, you know, we, 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 we would, like I said, just constantly rehearse. And the last place we moved to was back to our hometown in Hoboken. We had, uh, we had a place over, it was a little car wash called Artie's Car Wash. And that's where we, we played there probably for the next, you know, maybe like you know, four years or so. And again, religiously, you know, Sunday to Thursday, don't miss rehearsal or you're going to get, you know, a knuckle sandwich. Yeah, we, we did our first demo in, uh, it was actually uh, excuse me, January of 1984. We did that demo, sent that out to record labels. Within like two months, we, we had gotten the offer for the Metal Massacre 5 on Metal Blade. That was our first release, followed by Battle at Helm's Deep in 85. Uh, we, did, we did a compilation called Lamore Rocks based on the Club Lamore in 80, I think that was 86. Uh, we recorded the uh, Second Coming in 87. That didn't come out till 88. And it was after that that we had decided to kind of put the band to rest because the whole thrash thing was in full form and kind of the older school stuff like us wasn't so much hitting. And then we decided to get back together again. It was probably about uh, 2000. It was after our original guitar player Jim Mooney passed away. Our, uh, our bass player Lou Charlo said at, actually at his wake, we should do another album and dedicate it to Jim. And also we dedicated it to John Leone who had passed as well. So in 2004 we released Soul Taker. 2006, The Unknown. 2007, we did a kind of a best of compilation called Standing the Test of Time. Uh, the next one would be, it was probably uh, 2013 after that, we, we did the uh, Giants of Canaan album, which is when uh, Bobby Lucas joined and, um, you know, he, he joined the fold. Uh, 2016 uh, was uh, Sins of the World. I'm trying to remember now, I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> My memory's going. 2016, and then we just recently, a few, uh, probably about a month ago, we released the uh, Sins of, um, excuse me, uh, Armor of the Guys EP. And that's four new songs and two live songs that we recorded last uh, year. We played the Up to Hammers Festival in Athens, Greece. And so that's cool. We've never had live stuff out, and we've never done an EP, so that was a good thing for us to do, kind of break it up a little bit. It was 1988, and the second coming had just come out. Now we got we had great response to the record from all the magazines overseas and everything, but as as a performing band, when we would play live, we were on with a lot of heavier bands because thrash is really what was prevalent at the time, and it just wasn't uh, it wasn't working the way we wanted it to work. And because we we actually did like thrash too, we liked the heavier stuff. Lou Charlo and myself decided that it was time to put Attacker to rest, and at that time we we immediately started the Jersey Dogs band, which was a heavier, you know, which was, even even that wasn't really, you know, like total thrash, but it was a lot heavier than Attacker, and we wound up going in that direction because, you know, we wanted to still play, but we didn't want to beat a dead horse feeling that Attacker just kind of, you know, we couldn't get any more traction because of the way the scene had shifted towards thrash and extreme, you know, music coming out and, you know, death metal and stuff like that was all on the rise, so we decided to just, uh, you know, move on, and Jersey Dogs was that project. All right, so since I've been in the band, um, I've been on one full-length album, which was the uh, Sins of the World album that came out two years ago, 2016. Uh, we did a single, um, an Exciter tribute. I think it was Long Live the Loud was named, and we did um, 
Oh, I can't think of the song off the top of my head at the moment. I'll get back to that. But and then recently, a month ago, we just released uh, a new EP, Arm of the Gods. So as Mike was saying before, four new tunes, two live tunes that we recorded last year at actually up the hammers in Greece. Yeah, so since I've been an attacker, we've recorded and released uh, Giants of Canaan. Uh, also, we did the Riot tribute album, uh, the Exciter tribute. Um, then we did Sins of Sins of the World in 2016, and now we just released Armor of the Gods. And uh, you want to go back to the concepts? Was Giants of Canaan is based on the the Nephilim, the uh, in the Bible which were the 200 fallen angels uh, mated with the women of earth. They saw, desired the women of earth, the beauty of the women of earth, and they actually mated with them and the children. The offspring that they created were the Nephilim, and they were the giants of Canaan. And uh, I mean, there's been gigantic skeletons that have been dug up for probably about 100 years. And it, they've been, it's been, the information's been suppressed. They don't want, they don't want us to know that they were digging up 12 foot skeletons. I mean, if you dig and you go online and you search it, you'll see. They're, and and they just don't want you to know that these things happened. I mean, there was giant mounds that were found, and inside those mounds were huge bones of humans that they, they before the air hit them because they were so old. They deteriorated and they had um, like red hair on the skulls. And I mean, there's a lot of stuff you can look up there. They say that in, in Giant of Kandahar, look up the Giant of Kandahar on YouTube. You'll hear that story. It's freaky stuff. I mean, I, I'm into all that weird stuff, you know. Cryptozoology, you know, conspiracy theories, you know, all that stuff. Like uh, the Sins of the World with the alien on the cover, you know. It's basically a loose concept of uh, three songs, which would be um, uh, which would be World Destroyer, which is about Nibiru, the planet. The, uh, uh, then it would be uh, We Rise, which is about uh, humans being enslaved by Anunnaki, and um, you know humans are genetically engineered. Actually, would be uh, Archangel. It's like Archangel's like kind of like a ancient aliens kind of concept where demons and alien demons and angels are really interdimensional or extraterrestrial beings and that's the way we interpreted them as all that you know I mean it's in the it's in the Bible if you really read it and, and look read into it you know the beings of light and, and all kinds of you know the chariot you know the wheel within a wheel you know it's it's just really interesting stuff it makes for good lyrics so far I've been on two releases um, the Exciter tribute we did last year and the new EP, Armor of the Gods, and uh, it's, it's been an amazing ride with this band, and uh, I feel like they're all my brothers since day one, since we first met, and you know, like I said, Bobby, I was with Morbid Sin, and uh, it's just been fantastic. The first, uh, the first album, Battle at Helm's Deep, that cover that you see with like that bug thing and the and the little you know goblin and that it's funny that the, the He-Man guy looks kind of scared if you look at his eyes he almost looks like he's afraid. We actually had another a, a cover done by an artist in New York that we submitted to Metal Blade, and for some reason a few weeks maybe like a month later they told us that the cover was was uh, was rejected by Enigma the distributor. But we had been told by some our friends in Fate's Warning that they saw the cover on Brian Slagle's desk in, out in L.A. when they were out here doing their second album, and it looked like the cover had been all like all cracked or something. Like they may, maybe they tried to treat it with something and and it, and it you know screwed it up. So unfortunately, we got stuck with that bug cover because I remember when we first got the albums, like they never even showed us that until we saw the the product. And I remember Lou Charlo when we showed it to him, he was like. All right, where's the real cover? This is a joke, right? And we were like, no, this is what they sent us. So the, that, uh, whatever happened with the original cover, which was more, it looked more like a piece of artwork. And incidentally, I do have a clipping. They had taken a picture or something of that cover because there was a Metal Blade ad, I think it was in Circus Magazine. And that actual, that cover was, the, it was black and white, but that was the cover that was supposed to be on it. And whatever happened, they, you know, they wound up switching it to that crappy bug cover. 
um, the second coming, the guns that are on that cover, that was during the Cold War period with, you know, the U.S. and Russia. So really, unless you knew about guns, you didn't know that one was an American gun and one was a Russian gun. It was kind of a weird concept, which I don't know if people got, but, you know, we've had a history of bad covers, so <laughs> we took that and ran with it. Then, you know, once we got to uh, Soul Taker, that was basically, basically, it was the theme of, you know, the guy's a killer, a Jack the Ripper kind of killer, hence the knife, and you could see the woman's eyes in, in the knife, you know. Um, the Unknown, that was about a guy kind of losing his mind, and that was the, the, basically that cover was, you know, you could see the guy sitting there holding his head, and he, you know, just, you know, and there's like a specter behind him in the window. So he's just, you know, that, that just touched on that song. Uh, Standing the Test of Time, which was like the compilation album we did, that was like a conglomeration of like the different characters we be, uh, we used like uh, actually we used the re we had reissued those albums in '99 on CD. We had different covers used just to break it up. So we used uh, a piece of each of those two, which there was like a more like a Gandalf kind of character fighting you know the monsters in Lord of the Rings. You had that. You had a Jack the Ripper type of guy. You had the dragon from the Second Coming. And, and then you had like the Spectre uh, guy from the Unknown, and that tied in those four albums because it was a best of. Then when we got to Giants of Canaan, Bobby Lucas came up with the concept for that, which, which that's all biblical and stuff about, you know, the, uh, the Giants coming down and, and mating with, uh, uh, you know, the, the women on Earth, and, and you see them like, you know, basically scooping up the women. He, you can actually probably ask him about that a little more than myself. Sins of the World, same thing. He came up with the concept of that. It's about all the evils of the world and his little depictions of things, of you know whether it's you know uh, you know Hitler or bombs and things like that, all that kind of stuff, and that ties in with that. And the newest one, Armor of the Gods, is the title song is based on the Clash of the Titans. So that that the cover depicts you know Perseus holding the head of Medusa up, and that's that's kind of where we stand right now. And I have no idea what the next one's going to be, so we'll have to ask Bobby. I would say, like, as far as being in a band, you know, what I learned is, I mean, you it, you really have to massage relationships with people because, again, I, I actually in the band with the guys who are no longer in the band that, that we didn't get along great, I have, like, a bad reputation. So I learned you have to be more pliable with the people, and I hope with these guys, the current lineup, that, you know, I'm not as big of a dick as maybe I was at one time. <laughs> so, you know, but it, it's that, you know, and, and, and as far, you know, as far as drumming, you know, it's just... Uh, you know, it's just, I've always learned, play to your strengths. If you want to try things, like any musician, if you want to be, you know, if you want to do things that, that are tough to do, don't do them in the context of a band. Because see, I see people that sometimes, if you play out of what your skills are, you look bad. If you stay in your, you know, what you're strong at and do that well, you, you come across as looking better. Because I never perceived myself to be an amazing drummer. Like, I know my limitations. You know, but then when you talk to people and they'll say, oh, I love what you did in that song or this or that, I, the reason is is because I play, I play what I know I can play well. You know, and if I want to try something different and expand my ability, do, do that like in a rehearsal. But that's what I would say like even to the bands coming up. You know, play to your strengths first. You know, play what you play well. ACDC was, a, you know, a simplistic type of music, but they're great at it. You know, they, they write great songs. The drumming, people make fun of, used to make fun of Phil Rudd as a drummer. The guy's solid as a rock, you know, that's that's what he did, and he's, there's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to be Neil Peart or Mike Portnoy or those kind of drummers. Just be be yourself, be true to yourself, but most, like I said, the biggest thing, play to which, play to your strengths, don't play to your weaknesses, and then you'll, you'll always come across better to people. And one thing I always tell, like, new bands, when people, like, in interviews, people ask, hey, do you have any advice for newer bands? Stay in school, you can be in a band, and you can have a job, don't don't wait till you're like in your 50s or 60s and then, you know, kept trying to make it and have nothing to fall back on. You know, make sure you take care of yourself. Make sure that, you know, you, anybody around you, be it, you'll be able to stand on your own two feet. You can always be in a band and, and have a job and, you know, and, and try to better yourself. Don't just, you know, I mean, I, I know some people dive head in, but do both. This way you'll, you'll be happy in the long run, because I am. <laughs> Very simple question here. I started out with Attacker, with Warlock, became Attacker. Um, pretty much did that up until about, like I said, about 88. 88, to, uh, from then on, we started the Jersey Dogs. And really, after that, uh, you know, those were the two main bands I did. 
I did play, uh, probably, I would stopped playing for a while. After the Jersey Dogs broke up, which was about 93, uh, a bunch of us got married, kind of started all that, you know, family type of stuff. Um, about 95 or 96, I, I, had a, I started an Accept tribute band, because Accept was one of my all-time favorite bands. So that kind of got me back into playing again. So I did, the, um, I did that Accept tribute for maybe like two years. And then pr pretty much nothing on and off. And it was about 98 that we were contacted by Sentinel Steel Records to, re to re-release the first two Attacker albums on CD, because they were never on CD. Well, excuse me. The second coming was, I think, I think Mercenary had put it out later on, uh, unbeknownst to us, we didn't even know it ever came out. But really, those are really the only two bands that I really did. You know, I mean, I jammed with people, just fun stuff here and there, but as far as real bands, it's always been Attacker and the Jersey Dogs were the two bands that I, I, I put my focus on. I was never one to, to go into, you know, a, a million projects, you know, be part of, hey, I play with this band, play with that band. I've always been really solely focused on when I have something, I want to make that the best it can be instead of spreading myself too thin. And that's where we sit today. Still, Attacker is my main thing, my priority, and what I love to do. Yeah, my very first band was Morbid Sin. Uh, I formed that in high school. Uh, I, I think we started in 84. I want to say 83. Actually, if you want me to talk about the first band, I was it was a cover band called Harlot, and we did we did stuff like Maiden. This was pre pre Dickinson though. We were doing you know Deano Maiden. We were doing Twisted Sister, Scorpions, Kiss, um, Michael Shanker Group. Uh, this is God 1981 had to be because I was a freshman in high school, and these are all older guys, and uh, they had heard me. I was imitating Rob Halford in the locker room. And a uh, kid came up to me and said, can you do that on a microphone? I said, yeah, I don't know, I never tried. And went there that Saturday and I became a band member with those guys. All older guys, all like juniors and seniors. And here I am a freshman playing with these guys, you know. But um, then I formed my own band because I wanted to do originals. And uh, a couple of friends that I had met in school, we formed Morbid Sin. We actually did it on a dare for a Battle of the Bands because somebody else had, you know, was winning all these Battle of the Bands. And we kind of... Got into a little rivalry, and years later he became a bass player in the band too, so it was pretty funny. But I, I formed Morbid Sin in two weeks, and we wound up winning that battle. We took that battle. So ever since then we stayed together, started writing originals, and um, oh God, I was in Morbid Sin for many years. I mean, we, we had a little hiatus from probably 1994 until, I'm going to say, 98, maybe? 97, it was mm -hmm. right before I joined Seven Witches, and uh, we had played at Club Benet in, uh, with Fate's Warning, well, Fate's Warning, and Jack Frost band, Frostbite, and uh, he had approached me after we played, and we talked, and he's like, man, you know, I really like your voice, I have a deal set up at Massacre Records in Germany, so uh, let's get together, let's jam, see what we come up with. We got together, we jammed, we were like three songs, and you know, two songs in one, pro in one rehearsal, and then we came up with the third song the next rehearsal so we demoed those three songs and we got the deal with Massacre because uh, he had been playing with Dee Dee Verney in Bronx Casket Company so he had made some connections over there and they said hey if you got anything original you know let us hear it and, and we got the uh, we got the deal uh, that was my first real album it was with Seven Witches in 1998 uh, 99 it came out the second one came out in 2000, did both of those over in Germany, uh, Second War in Heaven, City of Lost Souls, then um, we had a little bit of a falling out, then I wound up joining Overlord. I did actually one progressive album, progressive project with guys from Eternity X, that was called Exhibition, it was just a one-off album for uh, LMP, Limb Music, and uh, then I demoed some stuff with Overlord, because they were getting back together, we did Return of the Snow Giant. And, uh, God, that was like probably 2004 when that album came out, was Return of the Snow Giant. And uh, did a bunch of shows with them, did one show, Keep It True, in Germany. And that's where I actually met Mike Sabatini at that show. He was there. He was just there to go to the show. Um, we talked, and I told him I was an Attacker fan. So it's kind of weird the way things came around. And it was the guitar player from Overlord who hooked me up with them, with, with Attacker. So, uh, yeah, basically that's it. I mean, um, then 
we had an unreleased album that Stormspell put out, Morbid Sin. That was the Sins of the Flesh that he put out, and then he put our two demos out from 1988 and 1992 onto one CD called the Demo Years. So um, I don't even know if he has any more of those. I, he's a small run he just put out there. But yeah, I don't even have any of those demos. <laughs> I don't even have a t-shirt anymore. Other people do, but I don't. That's funny. That's how they... Right. Attacker was my first real band. Well, Jersey Dogs was a precursor to Attacker. First um, introduction into like professional unit. Um, you know, before that I just played in cover bands. I even the original music we had I wrote, so it was very hard to get anything off the ground. It was all relied upon me to, to produce anything, cover songs and originals. So when I was uh, asked to join Jersey Dogs, it was my first glimpse at a, a professional unit and you know a tight knit machine that that was a you know a pleasure to be a part of for once and. Jersey Dogs, you know, presented itself to be a great opportunity for me to get to know these guys, be able to play, be accustomed, get accustomed to or fitting t together as a unit. And of course, when Attacker, trans, you know, we got back together, they, they reformed. They asked me to join. It was a perfect fit. And the rest is history. We, we, we work well together. We know each other for years. We're like family. And we couldn't be happier to be in this unit. My past bands I've been in have been Morbid Sin, uh, Mr. Grimm, a band called Supremacy way back in the 80s, um, and Gorge, a black metal band, and oh, a band called uh, Floor 13, uh, about 95 we were around. Uh, I joined Morbid Sin in um, the early 2000s, and I was friends with basically the, the lead guitar player at the time, Wade, Wade Tyler, who was passed away. Miss your brother, and um, we played for a few years at least. I think uh, doing the circuits, and we did a demo, and it was really fun, man. It was a great time. Um, pretty much just uh, you know destroyed everywhere we played. It was great. Yeah, back in the day, New Jersey was pretty pretty fertile. We had you have Overkill, you had Whiplash, you had Hades, you, you know you had Attacker. Um, who, who else might have been from Jersey? Yeah, yeah. Oh, bless. Yeah, blessed death. Who was uh, somebody just mentioned in a post on Facebook about yeah, blessed death. Uh, so there, there was a lot of bands. I mean, it was. I could probably. I'd probably have to sit here and think hard. But then there was some bands like uh, you know there was another local band uh, by us called Sneak Attack. Who they they were a great band. You know, really great band. They were on on Megaforce Records had done a compilation called uh, Born to Metalize. and uh, they had. I think they had like three songs on that, but they never went further than that. There was, you know, there was a band from Staten Island called Savage Thrust, which is like a cool, like uh, speed metal, uh, you know, borderline thrash. And incidentally, uh, just the guitar player Ed just passed away recently, so that was, you know, a shame to hear that. And uh, but there, like I said, there was. I'm trying to think of of some of the band name. I mean, there, there was literally so many bands back then that I would have to sit down and remember them all, you know. But like I said, really, it was probably a lot of the bigger names. Like I said, the Overkills. You know, uh, you know, Whiplash, things like that, Hades, and you know, they were the ones making, making a mark, and everybody else was kind of clawing to get their way up. You know, I mean, we even towards the end of Attacker, you had, you had, you know, stuff starting to come up like Biohazard and things like that. The hardcore stuff was kind of coming up, and uh, it was, like I said, it was a great time. But there really, there really was. A, there was also you had Cities. Uh, Cities was another another great band. You know, uh, big in the Lamore scene. Um, like I said, I could sit. I would have to sit here for like two hours and think of all the damn bands. But that was some of the names I can I can think of right now.